Hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you're listening to The Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm chatting with Ritvij Gautam. Ritvij is the head of user growth and retention at Glen Coco, and before that, he was the co-founder and CEO of Trimata. In this conversation, we take a deep dive into outbound sales. I know many marketers are skeptical, if not averse to outbound, but the reality is most B2B brands will, at some point, drive a significant amount of revenue via outbound. I've seen it firsthand. So in this conversation, we debunk some misconceptions around outbound, demystify what the process looks like, as well as tackle some ways that outbound is broken in its current state and how we can improve upon it. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Ritvij Gautam. You mentioned UFOs on the podcast intake form, so I got to start with that. <laughs> yeah, uh, what's your like what's my, your fascination with UFOs? Well, I, I've always been uh, I've always been a bit of a UFO nut, uh, not not in like the tinfoil hat kind of way, but just like obsessed with the sci fi concept of of like a UFO. Uh, at, like ever since the X Files, honestly, like I was big big like I want to believe. I used to have this T shirt, like you know the the X-Files poster, I want to believe. And I was all in on like Mulder uh, and Scully and like, you know, their antics and stuff. And, um, and so like, you know, I kind of followed it from that side, but most recently, like this year, it feels like we're like midway through uh, like an era of disclosure, like, you know, between like the New York times article that came out about like, Hey, the Pentagon has actually been funding a program to maintain, like to, to keep an eye on these, to like, like the Navy releasing footage from the Navy radar being like, hey, this is this is stuff that we caught, right? Uh, and we don't know what it is. And it's doing maneuvers that we can't explain to to like, you know, the, the hearings where like people at risk of perjury are testifying in front of Congress of having seen or come in contact with like US programs that have squared this stuff away. To me, it's just like, look, I'm not I'm not like all in on this stuff, but I'm like, hey, what for us constitutes like our barrier proof? Right. Because if you take like a macro to micro approach, like macro looking in, you know, for a fact that the Fermi paradox guarantees that there's intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, just given the vast expanse of it, it's all about a guarantee. And the more we become a space fitting civilization, it's easier and easier to imagine that, like, you know, we've been visited by one. And then, yeah, that's that's sort of my that's my two, two cents on UFOs, I guess. Do you, do you trust all of this new disclosure from uh, the government and, and officials? A lot of people think that it's a distraction. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say that it would be it'd be one hell of a psyop if it was like all a distraction. <laughs> and yeah, sometimes it's just like Hawkins Razor. Like I don't, I don't, I can't. I rack my brains as I might. I don't see why someone would risk the very serious downside of like perjury, a court martial, in jail just to like go and tell like a fantastical story in front of Congress, right? Like I, it's, it's like really hard for me to make head or tail of that. So I don't know, that's my two cents. And then, then there's just been more like ever since like, you know, there was like a hearing in Mexico, there was like, you know, people, there, there were like some mummified remains that were found that like went through, went through testing and it was verified as like not being a fake. So there's, yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> I saw the test, photo. But... Uh, uh, that photo looks so fake, but <laughs> yeah, I guess if it went that, through like, like testing, but yeah. <laughs> like how, I guess, how would you know that something which has up until now been unbelievable for you? How would you know that you're looking at a genuinely unbelievable thing. You know no what I idea. mean? I have no baseline. Like it's it's like no it's kind of a paradox in it a off priori. Itself, I suppose. So I have one more point yeah. on that. Do you follow Blink-182, Tom DeLong at all? <laughs> so, I, I used to, when I was younger, I used to follow Tom DeLong because Blink-182 and, and like the band itself. And now it's like, yeah, I know that he's, he's like a weird figure that's like, weirdly involved and pertinent in the ufo discussion which is again just super straight talking like, yeah and in 1999 it, he wrote that song called aliens exist right yeah. <laughs> and everybody's like oh that's like a, it's a joke song but then uh, later on you're like oh no that he was he was serious <laughs> <laughs> he was dead serious turns out yeah i go to the yeah. sandwich shop down the street and uh the guy that works there is always commenting on my t-shirts which i really enjoy so i, I uh -huh. think i've got a good collection but i had a blink 182 shirt on a couple weeks ago and he just looks at me and he's like so the singer was right about aliens 
I was like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a, uh, yeah, it's a funny topic. Like I'm not, a, you know, I know for a fact my wife's tired of me because I'm like, oh, we got to watch the, like, whatever, like watch the testimony. And she's like, it's just people telling stories of things they saw. And I'm like, but can you imagine the implications? And, oh my God, and that's, yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm like a what do you call? I think I want to believe is probably the best way to put my stance. Like I I don't yet I I, I do want incontrovertible proof, but I I do want to believe. Yeah. You gotta have faith. All right, um, you want to talk about sales, outbound sales? <laughs> yeah, stuff? strong switch. But let's <laughs> let's do it. Like speaking of out of this world, let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about outbound. Now uh, I'm supposed to do the transitions. That was good though. All right, so you mentioned that. Okay, so you're working at Glen Coco. Uh, outbound mm-hmm. sales, reinventing outbound sales. Before that, you were working on user experience, user testing, sort of qualitative research. Every company starts out with this phrase, like X is broken. Here's how we're fixing it. Here's the old way. Here's the new way, right? Right. So a statement that you mentioned was in-house outbound sales today is fundamentally broken. Yeah. What's the problem with outbound sales? Outbound sales as a function is critical. Like every, People are still doing it, right? Like the, the higher the ticket value gets, right? The efficacy of PLG and like, you know, but like PLG sales or just product only sales decreases. It starts becoming a significantly more human function, like a sales led motion. So outbound sales is something that a lot of companies still do, like tech companies still do. And the figures sort of support it. There's articles you can find on HubSpot, Crunchbase, uh, something like 57% of decision makers prefer the phone to be their first point of contact with a new company. Mm-hmm. It, and it's, uh, I think it's something like 63% of people that are active purchasers, like buyers, so, so high buyer intent, they are likely to return cold calls, right? But the ROI of cold calls in terms of like an absolute function of the number of calls you have to make is low. And that's, and we know that, but we're also like, nobody wants to leave money on the table. So outbound sales as a function is critical, right? It's, it's still, people are going to do it. The high, once you want to get into like high ticket value, like high, high value prospecting and stuff, it's, it's something you're going to do, right? Companies are going to do it. Companies are spending money on it today. The problem is the SDR job function at companies is one, it's viewed as a transitional role, right? So nobody's like, hey, you know, with with engineering and sales, you could be a lifetime sales guy. You could be like AE level five, you could be an AE your whole sales career and like knock it out the park, right? You can be a developer for your whole software development career without getting into management and that's fine, right? But the SDR job function is this like stepping stone intermediary function in in in-house sales teams. So what does that mean for sales companies? Right. This means that I'm hiring into a role that everybody that is in that role is trying to get out of it. Right. They're trying to get, get, get out of that into the next thing. One. And the data supports it. Like Gartner's report was like the average lifespan of an as in-house SDR is 14.2 months. That means like 43% of them, 43% of, of so that's the average, like the, the media, 43% of them are less than that. Right. So it's, it's even less than that that amount of time. And if you think about the amount of time it takes to ramp an SDR, that's like three months. You take 90 days for an SDR to like get trained up in-house and start ramping and start calling. So what you realize is when you do the math, you're actually with this group of people that A, are trying to get out of the role, as we said, but also their lifespan is so low because of like churn and things like that, that you're in the process of constantly hiring, constantly rebuilding this extremely volatile TCS ship, right? Like you're just constantly replacing this thing, trying to get it to go. And the outcome you're going for is, hey, I want qualified meetings. I want to add pipeline for my AEs, right? Like that's what we're doing. That's what we're going for. But you don't see the ROI on that until you've spent the 90 days, until you've spent the time. So like you're, the upfront cost of spinning up an SDR team is extremely high, right? And I've seen this. I've seen this from like personal anecdotes, people I know, like CEOs of other companies that are like, hey man, I want to do this outbound thing and sinking like a half million bucks into like setting up an outbound shop, an in-house outbound shop. And it just doesn't work because you don't, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So the problem, if I had to put it in a nutshell, it's high cost, high ramp, high volatility, or like, you know, just low certainty of returns. So it's hard to model as like, you know, like a a channel in terms of CAC and stuff. It's really hard to justify and hard to, hard to build out in-house. But the function is important. So that's that's where the problem is, hmm. uh, at least from the company standpoint, like B2B company standpoint. From the SDR standpoint, it's, yeah, look, I'm, I'm married to like one lead stream, right? And 
my like you could be the best caller on the planet but the odds of like given given how low the close rates are as is your odds of success when you're tied to one lead stream heavily heavily relies on how good that lead stream is how good the data quality is is are the leads enriched right and if that stuff is not happening and if, if management's not facilitating that stuff you're kind of stuck in a pretty shitty situation pardon my french right mm-hmm. so so that's where the mismatch is does that before before i kind of go and like and so Glenn Coco solves the problem. Like, does it, do you think that's a fair characterization of the problem? Yeah, I think so. I'd like to touch on one more thing um, yeah. before the sales pitch. So, okay, you're, you're going to be talking to a lot of content, SEO and growth people on this podcast. Okay, so I've worked at companies, large companies, where I can tell you firsthand that a large percentage of revenue does come from outbound. I was on a growth team that actually housed the SDR function. So I've seen mm-hmm. that side of the business and I... I personally agree with you that the function is important. But speaking to people who may not have had that exposure, I would imagine that two common objections come up, which is aversion. So I think there's some percentage of people who think, why buyers don't buy like this? Like, why would I want like an interruptive salesperson sending me, me an email or, or, or a cold call? Like, how, how does that work nowadays? Right. And it's almost like, because I don't do this, this is the old way of doing things. That's number one. Number two is, uh, I think, skepticism. Maybe they've tried it before. A lot of small business owners, in fact, I I was at a conference uh, last week where a bunch of agency founders were like, yeah, I tried it. It didn't work. You know, we we sent a thousand emails out and and nothing happened. Right. So I think there's skepticism as to the efficacy. Um, So I don't know what my question is here, per se, but I I guess like, how do those relate to like, I guess, the state of outbound and uh, uh, balancing that out with the fact that you say it's important. I've seen it be important. Yeah. I guess the question is like, hey, I, I, it's really a question of, hey, wh- at what point does outbound start becoming important, right? Because absolutely, there's like a ton of businesses that don't need outbound at all because the ticket value is low, right? Uh, am I going to be outbounding to people for like 99 buck a month deals? Obviously not, right? Like that, the ROI, if it doesn't make sense. So there's a ticket value at which outbounding starts making sense as a practice, and then also there is an ICP for which outbounding starts making sense of the practice. Now, when when people say I tried it and I kind of failed, I get that because guess what? I tried to do it in-house as well and I failed, right? Or I tried to contract out to like just an agent where basically an agency managed two SDRs for me and that too failed, right? Yeah. Because I had to I had to support those SDRs. I had to like be like, okay, hey man, well, here's all the tech, here's like, you know, whatever, and your outreach license. And and like, you know, I, I, had to, I had to support them and they were only as good at their job as I was able to facilitate. And I was like, the whole point of an agency is I don't have to think about this. So now I'm like paying someone to manage two guys that I'm, I am enabling anyway. So like, it just defeats the purpose. But I think with, with like the inbound world, right? Like inbound is a very powerful channel and like people ideally, like if I can get a solid inbound lead stream, nothing like it. I want that. Right. But the thing is just, you can't put blinkers on and be like, Hey, I just got, I just need to increase more people coming inbound because if I want to increase my sales, like that's just one channel, right? There's people that aren't inbounding to your site that could very well be potential buyers. There's, there's people that aren't finding you on Google or not searching the terms they are for your SEO. Like, you know, so they're not clicking on the link when you rank on it, but that doesn't mean they're not prospective buyers. So I think in terms of validating the concept, there's enough large companies that spin up outbound motions to be like, clearly not everyone is stupid. Like not everyone's like, Hey, let's just spend money, like just blow cash on, on spinning up SDR operations because we've not thought of any other way. It's because that is the stats show. Like again, 57% of decision makers prefer the phone as their first point of contact. And I think that's because of saturation of messaging in online channels, right? Like when's the last time you actually honest to God clicked on a B2B ad, right? Like I, I, I clicked on an ad for a set of pants the other day. That That's different. But when's the last time you clicked on a B2B ad? I, I can't, I can tell you, like, I can't remember the last time. It just, Maybe it just a search ad, but definitely not like a right. display like, ad. You know, yeah. it's like, I'm not saying it never happens. Like, it's just like, it, it, there is, there's the sense of like saturation, et cetera. So I can either, I can either look at the pipeline of like, Hey, my marketing increases like buyer, like, you know, it informs people in my ICP. It creates curiosity and interest, and then and then they funnel in, and that's definitely one pathway. But the the SDR pipeline allows you to go to like people that aren't being exposed to this stuff that might still be interested in your product if you just go talk to them, and that's that's what it is. 
So uh, I think I think the validity of it is probably you could you could say it's validated by the fact that a lot of companies do it. It's also validated by the fact that yeah, the the, the stats on like any surveys run, people are still like, yeah, dude, I I answer cold calls, mm-hmm. I I answer them. So it's one of these things where yeah, it has a low absolute percentage of performance, but it's also these things. It's like hey, twenty percent of the time it works, hundred percent of the time kind of thing. Like if if I get in on an outbound call and I, that person does express interest the the short the pipeline from that to like a deal close is very different right like it's like hey like yeah no i'm interested like let's let's get on a demo the next step is a demo right it's not like hey you signed up for the free trial i'm going to send you like four emails nurturing you and like nudging you to like engage with my platform and now like hey can you come sign up like that's i'm not i'm not disparaging that like that was oh, that, that was my you can disparage it if you want to <laughs> I, like, you the know, whole, you downloaded an ebook on the ultimate guide to X and now all of a sudden I'm going to nurture you into suddenly right. wanting to spend like, $10,000 on it. That makes less exactly. sense to me than a cold email. Right. Like I, to me, it's the same level of distance, right? Like it's uh, the only difference is, Hey, I happened upon the ebook, but in this case, someone's coming to me with a proposition, but like the odds of me going from ebook, like reading your ebook to like paying you 20 K a year on a license is about the same as me answering a cold call. And if I, if I, if I indicate interest on a cold call, that's like, why is that any less? Right? Like, so the question is just the hesitation comes around shit. Like I need to call a 2000 people or I need to call a thousand people right before I close one deal. It's like, yeah, then the odds, but you can increase those odds with like good data quality. You can increase those, but you don't want to leave money on the table. I can tell you, I can talk about existing customers of ours like that have generated like 750 K in pipeline spending only like $15,000. What do you say to them? They're, they're investing in this as a channel and it's working. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Like, yeah, it's not like the perfect conversion channel, but you're not going for perfect conversion. You're going for like, Hey, a smooth CAC that I can rely on to fill up my pipeline. And it's also where you action it, right? Like if I'm an early stage company, like if I'm, if I'm like day one, how can I show revenue with, with my SEO strategy? Like dude, that thing takes nine months to build up like six to nine totally. months. What am I, am I not going to sell until then? Right. If I'm not, if, if, okay, if it's taking six to nine months to build up in the interim, like, how am I, how am I selling? What are my odds of getting in front of customers? Like word of mouth and then what? I think that people maybe look at outbound like I, I I don't think there's such thing as pure outbound anymore. I think like clearly things like brand and clearly having inbound channels has to help. Like if you were just like a a, a single page website with a good product, let's say you had a great product, and all mm-hmm. you did was send emails out and cold calls, I feel like that in in the best case scenario, that's probably not going to work that great. I mean, it, it probably does for some. Doesn't it like info product? You probably sell an info product that way. If you're like Jordan yeah. Delphore or something like that, you're not going to sell an enterprise SaaS tool. That no, way, I would imagine. Like these things no. are complementary. Absolutely right. It's just it's just amplifying your message, right? Like so, even even if someone gets on a call and they're like, oh, like I'm I'm interested, I'll check that out. Like you know, someone after after a cold call is like, can you send me some more information? And then you send them an email with a link to your website. And your website ideally has like a really nice FAQ section and like, you know, it has, has case studies and has this. So what you've done is you've taken someone that wasn't thinking about you, wasn't thinking about your company at all. And now at the very least, they're definitely at least thinking about you, right? Like now does that result in a sale or not result in a sale? All of that remains to be seen, but that's, that's true of someone that clicks on a CPC ad as well, right? Like it's just, Hey, this person wasn't thinking about you earlier. They were scrolling through their feed and then your ad popped up. They were like, hmm, "I mean, take a look at this thing." So, so like, it needs to be in place in order for a sales outbound sales development program to work. What I've heard you say is it's got to be a sig- significant price point, right? If it's too low, if it's product led, if it's freemium, the economics may not work out for you. Uh, that may have to be in place. The targeting whom you're sending emails to, right? Like they've got to be in your market. Um, and then there's a timing yeah. factor too, right? Like that's, that's maybe the numbers game is like, even if I'm sending to all CMOs, not all of them are trying to hire an SEO agency right now. Right. And then there's the messaging. It's like, what are your differentiators? And like, how are you going to open that front door into the conversation? Do you agree with those? Is there anything else I'm missing? Yeah, I, I, I agree with all of those. I think with on the CMO, the idea of like reaching out to all CMOs, et cetera, you, you asked me what you need to have in place. Or, or like, what are the parameters at which you need to start considering outbound? So yeah, definitely deal size is one. I would also argue like 
product complexity is another one, right? Like mm-hmm. we, we've noticed like a lot of deep tech, like infosec type of companies, they prefer outbound because it's like so technical as a product. Mm-hmm. The odds of like you coming on my website and finding all the questions you have, like getting the answers to all the questions you have, all of that kind of gets slim. So uh, we have a couple of customers that are doing outbounding to like CISOs and and those, and they, they do it because it's like, yeah, it's easier to just get on a call with them and chat with them, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. it's just fundamentally easier. So I'd say, yeah, understanding your ICP, understanding whether your ICP, like how, how big your cam is and how stratified like your ICP is, right? Like is, is your ICP like just a handful of decision makers versus like anybody that's a UX designer at all, right? If I was Figma, I wouldn't be outbounding to UX designers, getting them to use Figma. Like that wouldn't be like, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't do that, right? Mm-hmm. I, I might outbound to like VPs of design at like massive organizations being like, hey, do you want to like overhaul your design system in and out, right? So the level at which you want to get in and the price point are like what to me determine whether or not you want to do it. And then you need to be able to, you, you should have done the math yourself as a business and you should do this regardless of whether or not you're going to do outbound on like, hey, what is like the CAC to LTV ratio that you're going for, right? Like, if, if, if you calculate your CAC and you're like, you know, you're like, Hey, my, my customer acquisition cost is whatever, like $5,000 per customer. And my it, like average contract value is the, you know, whatever, 20 grand. Then you're like, okay, like, yeah, I have a one at one, one is to four CAC to LDB ratio. So I would theoretically, that tells me like, I would spend five grand on getting an additional customer because I know that takes, yeah, that gets me 20 grand on the other side. Mm-hmm. Right. And once you know that map, then you're like, okay, that, that five grand, the materialization of that five grand is just a combination of your ad spend and then like your like sales team headcount. So it's like, okay, can you find that spend elsewhere? Like, can you manage that, manage to be play within your CAC to LTV ratio threshold when spinning up an outbound channel? And if the answer is yes, then you absolutely should do it. Do you think that this is, or sales development anyway, is ultimately a numbers game? I'm asking, and this is where the selfish uh, questions come in. So competitors, plug your ears. Let's say a large percentage of our sales are what I would consider sales. It's outbound, mm-hmm. right? It's not like marketing channels play into our sales, but largely what we're doing is is sales. It's not a high volume method that we're employing mm-hmm. right now. I won't go into details, but I would love to experiment with sales development. I would love to do outbound emailing, maybe calling. I'm not sure if that's particularly what CMOs or VPs of marketing want. Is mm-hmm. If I want to invest in this, is it simply going to be a numbers game or how do you you know, it's such a tough sell. It's like, who's in the market for an SEO agency? Who can pay us? Like, maybe do you have to send a thousand emails to get 20 people who are actually in that fit? Or what's your thought on that? Look, uh, saying it's a numbers game, it, that will always be true to an extent, right? Like you have a list of whatever, 10,000 people. You put that through like a data enrichment exercise, like, you know, using Apollo or Zoom Info. And then that, that, whittles that list down to like, okay, I have 8,000 people on that list now. And then you start emailing out to them that might or might not, like you might or might not get responses. You start calling out to them again, you might or might not get responses. So there will be like a natural like funnel and breakdown. So obviously the more, like the larger the number is, the larger your absolute values are given like the step downs and percentages. What I will say is finding the right lead stream, like up top, right? So that changes the whole game. So like the, mm. this is where like the data enrichment and defining the data. So we encourage, for example, all of our customers to define their qualifying criteria to go beyond a title, right? Like you can say, hey, I'm selling to CMOs, but you could be like, well, I'm C- selling to CMOs that have like an average ad spend of north of 20K a year or north of, north of 200K a year up to you, right? Uh, you can look at like company headcount. You can be like, hey, it's CMOs of these kinds of companies because you find like this type of SEO, like B2C SEO is like your jam or B2B SEO is your jam, yeah. right? Like, or like uh, triggers, so, like have they accepted a new job? Have they recently raised funding? Right. Have right. they blogged actively in the last month? Like, are they using X piece of technology? Like all of these would be sort of lead scoring signals. Exactly. So you're like 100% on the money. So the, the better you get at your list, right? And then then it's just a question of like, hey, I'm, I'm reaching out to all of these people. I'm, I'm going to be touching all of these people. The ones that are likely to buy will buy, right? And and the rest that might not be interested at the time have at least like planted a seed. Contrast this with otherwise, it, it would be a safe bet that off this list of people, maybe some of them might have found me.
So as an SEO agency, like we we have a couple of agency customers as well that that are outbounding to to people, and that's the same thing. Like that's how they do it. They look at hey other vectors outside of title. Like yeah, I sell it to this job function, but my, I'm increasing my odds of success if I'm selling it to the person in this job function. If their ad spend is at this level, if they're if they were recently jo- if they recently joined the role, if their level of activity is high, if they use this other tool or have used it in the past, right? You can just start getting more and more specific, and then when you put that lead stream in. Yeah, you're outbounding to them. You're outbounding them cold. So it's like, you know, these guys don't wake up every day thinking about an SEO agency, but you're starting that conversation. And that that is, in effect, valuable, right? So like, if, I guess if, if I were to ask you like, hey, man, would you, would you pay 15 grand to generate 750K in Byte in three months? Would you? That, that's that's an obvious yes, but like I would come right. in with skepticism like, for sure. sure. I, I understand, right? Like, and, and this is just how hypothetical based on one of our customer case studies, right? Like the results vary based on, again, how, like who the target demographic is and stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's just, you need to make peace with the spend. You need to be willing to spend on it. Like you need to decide that, hey, this is what it's worth to me, like to get a new customer. Like what is a customer acquisition cost you can stomach, right? Stratified by ch- channel if you have to. And then that gives you like, the ability to action it. And then you can experiment with it. So coming back to the problem with like in-house outbound motions, the challenge is people, before I can even experiment with this, like, hey, does outbound work? Like, yeah, if you send a thousand emails and it doesn't work, you can't be like, outbound doesn't work for me. Like, mm-hmm. you know, have you tried it? Like, you know, it's on average, like uh, with cold calling, for example, you need to make six calls before someone answers. Or are you doing uh, it the right way? Like if you, exactly. uh, if you publish a thousand pages, and say SEO doesn't work. Well, what was the strategy? Like, were the pages there you go. high quality? Like, did you build links? Where how was the technical SEO? Like, if none of that was in place, it's not just the mere fact that you published a thousand pages. It's that you did it wrong, and that's why it didn't work. Yeah. So, so, and I think like the reason why outbound gets demonized more is because when you spin up in-house outbound operations, the cost is so high to you upfront that even even though people are like, I am willing to do this experiment, like unless you're seeing outcomes, the outcomes will feel sporadic for you, right? Over a long period of time, you'll be able to actually see a good like CACTA LTV, like you can make that do that math, right? Mm -hmm. But but in the short term, like it's just going to be sporadic and you're going to be like, but my cost basis is static, but my outcomes are sporadic and that's like hard to sit with. Well, I'll I'll give you something here too. And you mentioned on the cost savings or like you have to spend money to make money type idea, which is true in SEO as well. So that's the background I'm coming from. And like SEO, I'm sure AI is impacting this perception on sales. So like if I were to say like, hey, I don't want to spend that much money. I don't want to hire SDRs. I want to just like see if this works just to like prove it out. I might just spin up a bunch of AI, you know, messaging frameworks and send them out using an automated list generated from whatever data pool and just test it out that way. So like, is that a valid way to do things? I'm asking because it's a little bit facetious because I'm sure that if you just spin up a bunch of shit, you're not going to get shit back. But (laughs) <laughs> How is yeah, AI? So, <laughs> what's the role of AI in sales right now? So, so the role of AI in sales, I'd say like a lot of the email communique, a lot of like just the text-based communique is going to get AI generated. Same with like SEO article generation, like AI, I don't, I don't ever see it as replacing an SEO function, but what it does is it does accelerate it. It allows you to accelerate it. It allows like your output of SEO content to increase because you're, you're more focused on the optimization piece more so than like just you know, you have to come up with the original idea. You have to like prompt hack a bit, get like a first draft going. And then that's where you kind of get your hands in there and get dirty. At least that's, that's how I do it. So that that AI has a role. And I think for the email stuff, like the outbounding email stuff, AI is going to play a big role. Like it's going to, it's going to, it's going to be able to like aggressively AB desk like email content for you. It's going to be able to like send out different emails, titrate it and, and just like learn it. And if we're talking like, let's look at like near future, 10 years down the line, like that's how I see AI playing a role in, in outbound sales. For me, cold calling is interesting because like AI cold calling is actually regulated against funnily enough. Like, you know, people talk about really? like AI replacing SDRs and stuff. It's regulated against. There's the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. It's literally, there's restrictions. So you can't do AI uh, calling? Yeah, the FCC.gov. Unless there's explicit consent from the person that's being called, you cannot basically do a robocall. I mean, like, before AI calling was AI calling, it was robocalling. And robocalling was like a scourge, and it was it was legislated against for a reason, right? So uh, just because AI sounds more human doesn't mean it's not robocalling anymore, right? It's, it's still going to be robocalling. It's still going to be dealt with by, like, the same, same provisions. So cold calling is... 
to me, like it'll be the last human frontier of sales, right? Like uh, at least outbound, the outbound function of sales. Uh, once, once people like, you know, once someone's in the pipeline, like the AEs and the conversations and stuff, like I'm, I'm very, very skeptical. I roll my eyes very hard on any sort of AI replacement conversations. I heard these in the UX world as well. Like, oh, AI designers or testing with synthetic users or user research without the users, like all of this, like, you know, this kind of snake oil of like humans being replaced by AI that keeps happening. But if you look at like functions and channels and things that will be impacted by AI, I think like the email function is going to get super centralized in an organization. Our CEO, for example, uh, Ing Wong, he was on like the sales floor of Mercata and he was talking to me about how it's like a legendary sales floor, but Mercata is known for having a phenomenal sales engine. And what they did is earlier, they used to let like SDRs run their own sequences, like email sequences. And then down the line, they, they, he was telling me about how they centralized it because they found that, hey, like there's a formulaic aspect to this. We get someone in who just understands email behavior in and out, like in its nitty gritty. And they just program sequences and run email sequences for the entire sales org. It becomes less of like, an individual, individualistic touch. And I think AI will just like further that centralization function in, in, in outbound sales. But for calling, that will remain human. I, I, I agree with most of that. I, I think that um, the second order consequence of AI being so easy for people to kind of spray and pray is that people are going to become uh, uh, sensitized to it. You know, it's, it's like... Absolutely. Uh, so some of the human side tends to be more effective in that world. So in that world, maybe it's more interesting. Yeah, cold calling could still be effective, but also if I go get lunch with somebody, like that's going to stand out nowadays, right? Um, yeah, the, the human touch matters more, right? Like it, it becomes more, like the more noise there is, the more a human touch starts mattering, right? Like it, it, it's unique when like a couple of people are doing it, then when everybody does it, it becomes the noise again. So it's to stand out from the noise, you need to do something different. And mm-hmm. that, that's always going to be the case with like with with sales. Yeah, like I think you know AI's application will come. It will have impacts. It'll it it will fundamentally alter like sales pipeline, sales function. But I I also think that there will be some aspects of it. Like in fact, with with the increase in like AI outbounding, like you might just get desensitized to any emails in your inbox that are not from people you know. Right. Like you might just be like, all right, like, I just don't want to deal with this. Right. Yeah. Like direct mail yeah. nowadays. Uh, exactly. Could make like, a return. Who knows? Um, how is Glen Coco solving this? So how, how Glen Coco aims to solve at least uh, like solve this problem with sales is we've created a B2B sales marketplace. So like a sales development marketplace and the value prop on the customer side, right? Like, so people, the like companies that are looking to set up outbound motions. If we characterize the problem as high ramp, Right, like high cost, high ramp, variable outcome, and that's the problem. There, we've allowed them. We our model allows them to go to low cost, low ramp, fixed outcome. So, like fixed cost, fixed outcome. Right, and uh, the way we do that is customers can come on Glen Coco, they can set up a training module for, hey, here's how you cold call for my product. Because the person that's cold calling it doesn't need to be able to close the deal. They just need to be able to talk about the product intelligently enough, talk about the solution, et cetera, to get this person to show up for a meeting with an AE. The training and threshold for that is quite a bit lower. So we let customers set up that training and then customers are able to upload a leads list. We enrich those leads for the customers as well. Those leads get plugged into our dialer and that this is where we have a community of fractional SDRs and they're able to start calling using our tech. We've built a smart dialer, a smart scheduler, and they're able to call in to the leads and start booking meetings. And the companies only pay per qualified meeting booked. So now it's like a standard channel. It's like, hey, what what would a qualified meeting, for example, if I asked you, Alex, like, hey, what would a qualified meeting with a CMO be worth to you? Would you pay pay like 300 bucks for like qualified meeting with a CMO? Like a CMO that has like the ad spend threshold that you want and has been active blogging in the last like two weeks? So on and so mm. forth. I right. do have that number. Um, I right. can't say it, I, but I, and I do have, have that you criteria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, like, you know, but if yes, that was your number, yeah, you'd yeah, be like, sure. hey, this is a way for me to try the outbound channel out. Because the math works pay, out, it works out. Yeah. Right. I only pay for valuable things. And you get to say what the math is, and you get to say what the qualifying criteria is. Mm, and then you just go. plug this, and this thing runs. Right. So you have de risked your outbound operation. Right. Like, you, you've de risked your attempt at experimenting with an outbound operation. Like you're not, you're not like shit. I have to hire like five guys and, and pay the salaries for five people, go through like, you know, the, the cost of the implied cost of like hiring five people and then like, you know, go through the 90 days ramp for five people of training them 
and then then see if this thing works right like that used to be the upfront cost now it's just like i just need to build up a training and i specify the price i want per qualified want to pay per qualified meeting and i get to specify what i think of as qualified and i only pay when one of those people walks in the door then i see if this is worth it for me or not so that's on the company side and on the sdr side for people because the sdr role is a transitional role there's a lot of turnover there's sdrs that are constantly frequently changing jobs and the sdr pay scale is it, it's probably the only job role where i've seen this like I, I can't even think of a marketing equivalent for this where someone's like you know hey you you get paid like a really really low base and then you're comped on ote like the sdr's upside is all bonuses mm-hmm. right and but oftentimes a lot of companies it's bonuses conditional on making quota or tied to like a commission cap and stuff like that and it's just like dude this job is hard enough as it is so for like sdrs that are working you know all of them are working jobs this is a great way for them to leverage their existing skill set in like a super sleek tech enabled environment so they're able to call way more often they're able to they're able to like you know track their leads through way more often and they're able to do that for multiple different companies and it's free they can do it for their own time like on their own time they get paid instantly per qualified meeting booked and they can train up and call for multiple different companies at at their leisure so it makes it super accessible for them too yeah. i love it hell yeah I, so we're coming up on time, but I have two questions uh, because mm-hmm. your your intake form, you had two things that I didn't understand and I'm okay. going to need you to explain them. So, sure. all right. You, you mentioned you wanted to talk about revitalizing accrued inbound with strategic outbound motions. What does that mean? That's a lot of jargon, isn't it? Uh, what, <laughs> what that really means is like a sales team has like a finite bandwidth to deal with. Inbound. Like what happens even with an inbound pipeline, right? Like if you're a company that has like a killer inbound pipeline you're not closing all the deals that are coming in through your inbound. So there's like sales activity for the inbound leads that you accrued like in the first month, three months, right? Like there there might still be activity and revitalization. But what, like if you've been in business for like five years and, and you know, you have like a throughput of like, you know, whatever, 10,000 organic signups a year, like that's like 50,000 leads that are just sitting. And mm. if they were at least interested enough to sign up at one point, but your sales team is not going back and like, doing a strong revitalization effort with these people. They're getting your newsletter. They're getting like the once in a blue moon, hey, we miss you email. And that's the extent of it. But what you can do is you can take these these 50,000, you can enrich them again. So if like someone has changed job roles or job functions, et cetera, you're able to get where they're at because the person in question at least was interested enough to look your tool up. So you're able to make that worth its while by plugging that into an outbound SDR like cold calling motion and be like, hey, like take up the phone, call these people and see if they're interested today. Like, who knows? Maybe. So I think, like, the longer a company's been around, you just accrue this asset of, like, this a mailing list, and it just is severely underutilized because it, all it gets is the occasional, like, newsletter email, and it gets, like, the occasional, hey, the revitalization attempt email, which is, like, pretty weak sauce. So that that's what I want to talk about. It's like, hey, you can just plug it into an outbound motion, and, and you again, you get to decide, like, hey, what would I be willing to pay to revitalize like one of these guys, like get one of these leads that signed up and never bought with me earlier, like, you know, two years ago, what would I pay to get them back into a demo with me and back into conversation to show them how I've changed and show them how the tool has changed? Because your product is improving and like, you know, you, you've had growth since when this person signed up, but you want to be able to effectively communicate that because that might be the difference between like, oh, I wasn't ready to buy earlier, but I am now. That so honestly inbound feels and like such work hand in hand. Yeah. low hanging fruit. That's something that we we should look into that. (laughs) Um, I now have a word for it. Uh, The second thing was, uh, you mentioned the role of imaginative resistance in storytelling. Oh, oh, this is this is like my favorite. So uh, this is like partly me trying to make use of like the remnants of my philosophy degree from Claremont. What I wrote my thesis on was this concept of imaginative resistance. In a nutshell, it's your imagination is not infinite in its capacity, etc. What it's able to do, it's very good at doing is taking base piece of information that you've gathered, like, you know, through your perception and stuff and organizing and reorganizing it to put it into different shapes and this thing. And that's how that's how you ideate, really. So it's really like your 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 odds at innovation are, you know, if, if you and I have the exact same bases of information, I innovate by rearranging the stuff in my head in a different way than you do the stuff in your head. 
or the other way for me to innovate is I have stuff in my head that you don't have in your head, right? Like that, so you, you with me so far. Yeah, yeah. So if I have a okay. red block and a blue block, I could innovate if you had only blue blocks. But if we each had those blocks, it, well, let's say that there was yeah, three, like then you, we could rearrange them in different ways. To Right. If you don't yeah. think to put them together to make a purple block, but I do, then that's me innovating, right? But there's limits to your imagination. So like in sto- in storytelling, right? There's, I, I think an easy way to, to come up on something that's like imaginative resistance. Imagine if I told you a story and like, you know, I'm telling you about, I'm not even describing a dystopic society. I'm just talking about a society today. And I'm like, and Mary killed her baby because of course that's the right thing to do. Like, you'd be like, is this story like pitching? This is the objective truth. It's not telling me about, imagine a dystopic world where, people think it's okay to kill their baby. It's just, this, this story is just telling me, hey man, kill your kids because it's good. You'd be like, whoa, I can't mm-hmm. engage with that. Like, you know, you, you're actually, you, you're ejected out of the fiction. You can think of like uh, some real world examples, uh, the movie Gone with the Wind, right? It paints the super like idyllic, lovely, cozy time period of like peak slavery, like Southern America, right? So if you watched it today, you'd be like, this is not at all okay. Like, you know, we, we use mm-hmm. the word problematic, et cetera. It's because you cannot engage with that fiction anymore. Right. Mm. Because it's you're having a hard time imagining everyone being like happy and singing songs mm. and being hunky dory okay. in that situation. Right. Or if I asked you to watch like a Lenny Riefenstahl film, right, like a pro, like a like a Nazi propaganda film and you watched it, you might be like, dude, this is ridiculous. Like triumph mm-hmm. in the will. You'd have a hard time. So that that's imaginative resistance. So where it comes into play in storytelling is I need you to be able to when, I, when I'm making a sales pitch to you, like it's it's really just me trying to tell you a story about, hey, man. I've understood your problem and I can solve your problem. But the way I communicate the second piece is I need to make sure that you can imagine how my product solves your problem. Like you can imagine solving for these pain points. It's why we care. It's why we care to think about pain points. It's like, hey, what is the point of relatability at which this person can actually like start engaging with my solution? Because otherwise I could just show up and be like, hey, like I have these 10 features. And you'd be like, this is, okay. Right? But I'm like, hey, feature number one helps solve your problem mm. in this, this, and this way. And like, this is why. Like, have you ever had this problem? It's like, okay, hey, I can relate with that. I have, I can imagine that. I can imagine this alleviating that burden for me. That's when you start making inroads. Because if you're not coming hand in hand, like when people talk about like new product releases or like new product launches, feature launches, and they don't talk about the why behind it and break down the why to make it so that their ICP could relate with it, then you're just like saying stuff people might or might not be able to like engage with it. It's like, hey, how how does like an improved round robining system actually help me? Like, unless you walk me through the steps of that, unless you get me to a point where I can imagine that going to work for me, you're not going to be able to get through to me. And that's and that's what it is. Like that that's the concept of like imaginative resistance. And like it, it has like it's been like my favorite thing to talk about, even even when we talk about like UX and like UX lexicography. Like, you know, if you saw, for example, a menu with like these three horizontal lines. Or if you just saw these three horizontal ri- lines on the page right now, you assume that it's a menu, mm-hmm. right? And that's only because like Xerox used this as its menu, like menu function as like earliest printer manuals. And that just stayed in. Now it's like part of the lexicography. Mm-hmm. But if you click this, so, and what that is, it's like an active participant of fiction. You're just like, hey, this needs menu, right? And, and it doesn't for any other reason other than that, like you're participating in this active imagining with me. But the moment you click on something like this and let's say the volume goes up, right? Mm. You're going to be like, this is not what it's supposed to do. Like why, why is these horizontal lines supposed to inherently mean anything? It doesn't. It's just, you have in your head a sense of like what this is supposed to work like. And if it performs counter to that, you're going to experience imaginative resistance. You're going to be like, in which case you eject from the fiction, which is this website. And you're going to be like, this website's shit. That, that's what like imaginative resistance is uh, in a video. It's this idea of like when you're presented with like fictional propositions to imagine counter to like the building blocks in your head, you eject from the fiction unless you're able to retool the stuff in your head. Mm-hmm. You can also yeah. have permanent imaginative resistance, right? Like if I told you imagine a spherical cube, you just can't because it's just it like it's, it's an axiomatic incongruity. You just can't. There's temporary and permanent imaginative resistance and temporary imaginative resistance, overcoming that in storytelling, making sure you're thinking about, hey, can people imagine how my thing is going to go work for them? Makes all the difference in impactful copy. That is a fascinating idea. We we talk a lot about somewhat of this issue with regards to positioning. And I don't know, sometimes we're so close to the SEO problem, we'll come up with just the most esoteric ideas. And we always have to pull ourselves back and be like, 
we got to speak the language people understand. Like this is going right. to confuse the shit out of people if we use this language. Absolutely. It's simple in its practice, but I think conceptually, it's like, why does this matter? To me, it's like, hey, you're literally asking people, trying to tell them a story and you're like, hey, imagine this, right? That's, it, it's an invitation to come and imagine something. Like when I put a piece of copy in front of you or, or like give you a sales pitch, it's like invitation to imagine like, hey, this can solve your problems. And I need to be able to have you see this my way. And to do that, we need to make sure you're not, I'm not brushing up against your imaginative resistance. I'm putting forth the proposition in a way that you're capable of imagining it, right? Mm, that's super cool. I'm glad we brought that up. We're at time. What uh, oh, well, do you want to promote? Where do you want to send people online? Well, well people online, th- thanks for listening to me ramble about UFOs and everything. <laughs> everything else is everything. UFOs gets its own mention, clearly. <laughs> I'm the head of user growth at Glen Coco. We built this sick B2B marketplace. We're adding more companies, listing on the marketplace every single week. So if you're a company looking to spin up like an efficient, low-cost outbound motion, come to glencoco.com, come chat with us. And if you're an SDR that's looking to supplement your existing income with like doing some quick, easy outbound work, come chat with us at glencoco.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Alex. 